Good evening, everybody. Thank you. I'm so deeply honored to welcome and to thank everybody for joining us this evening. My name is Omar Dominguez. I am the Director of Government Relations and Sector Development at Vantage Point. I'm also a Vancouver City Planning Commissioner. The Planning Commission is a body of volunteers. Um, the Planning Commission is a body of volunteer citizens which are appoint appointed by Vancouver City Council to advise on the future of our city. Now, I can't emphasize this enough, and I urge you to remember this throughout our whole conversation this evening, is that we are not elected officials or in any way employees of the city. We're citizens who represent diverse perspectives in our city. I was born in Mexico City, the land of the Mexica people, indigenous people. My father comes from a small farming village called Wiramba in the state of Michoacan, which is about four hours northwest of Mexico City. My mother comes from a village called Buena Vista in Chiapas in the south of Mexico. For most of the last 20 years, I have been an uninvited guest on the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And as we gather this evening, I want to pay my respects to their ancestors, elders, past and present, who are stewarding these lands for thousands of years. And as we come together this evening in the month of June of 2020, we acknowledge that this is also Indigenous History Month. We take this opportunity to celebrate the courageous resilience and the wisdom of Indigenous people. At the same time, we condemn the unjustifiable harm, violence, and that colonization and systemic racism and oppression has inflicted on multiple generations of indigenous, black, and people of color. These historical systems of colonization, exclusion, and oppression are the foundation of the current cities in which we now live. Land use planning here in the city of Vancouver also segregated and privileged access to land and resources to benefit white colonial settlers. To this day, you can find land titles in our city with covenants that were meant to prevent the sale or rent of land to people who were of indigenous, Chinese, Japanese, and African descent, among others. And while these explicit forms of discrimination are now illegal, their lasting impact continues to disadvantage communities and are a painful reminder of a racist past. The Planning Commission itself also bears responsibility for the legacy of this colonial history. A legacy that we have committed to understand, to acknowledge, and to heal. And over the last months and weeks, all of us, have been reminded that there's still so much to do. We have seen the unprecedented global impacts of COVID-19, which disproportionately affect equity-seeking communities. We have seen an increase in drug overdoses in our city. We have been faced with the growing recognition of systemic instances of police brutality and heartbreaking racial violence. We recognize that so many of us are facing ill health and a precarious economic outlook. So many of us are grieving, angered, confused, and isolated. We're increasingly aware of the harmful impacts of colonization on our communities and in our personal lives. How then can we heal and redress the historic harmful legacy of the past. 
this is hard work. Traumatic, in fact, for many people. But the urgency of this moment compels us to come together to seek understanding, support, and community in this difficult work. So, as we embark on this dialogue, our hope for this evening is that we take this opportunity to create a space for kindness, mutual respect, mutual acknowledgement, and mutual support. So I would like you to, I would like to invite you to take three deep breaths together as we ground ourselves on these intentions. Thank you. The mandate of the Planning Commission is to advise the major and council on topics that relate to the future of the city. On a broader level, as role as conveners of dialogue, we provide and support space for thoughtful conversations about how our city is evolving. These dialogues bring out ideas for what we need to pay attention to as we look to the future to help us make choices that guide our evolution in a direction that leads to a just, equitable, decolonized, and an inclusive city. And um, I'm wondering if Councillor Fry has been able to join us. I know that he was um, at a uh, public hearing this evening, so I'm not sure if he was able to to come and join us. So I don't think he's with us, but in the meantime, um, I'd like to acknowledge that we have a number of other commissioners and a large team of people that are supporting us in the background, um, and uh, you will see their names in the chat. From SFU Public Square, also really grateful for their um, partnership to put together this event. And um, we have Seth Eris and Sa Sachi Tanaja. Um, and also for our hard of hearing audience members, we're providing closed captioning through Elizabeth Royal with Accurate Real-Time Inc. And to help us assist with comprehension. This may also help as some of our non-native speak speaking, like myself, are not native English speakers. Uh, and a transcript of this evening discussion will be provided after the chat. And uh, working from Vancouver Island, um, from Clahoos Nation, visual storyteller, Patricia McDougall, who will be visually recording tonight's discussion. Now, a little bit of housekeeping announcements. Um, tonight's discussion, it's the first in a series of online conversations. And this is how we adapted the summit that we had planned for May of this year on the Vancouver we want, the city we need, which was canceled due to the current circumstances. So we're truly humbled by the overwhelming success and interest of this event. Uh, we know that uh, you're in touch with something that resonates with the community when uh, we had to up our Zoom account up to three times to accommodate close to 600 people that had registered for this event. And uh, the people that are in this call include representatives from advisory bodies uh, from the city of Vancouver, city staff, community organizers, architects, planners, interested citizens, and uh, dear friends and family. And uh, while well, participants are mainly here from the city of Vancouver, there are also people uh, joining us from Nanaimo, to Boston, to India, to Mexico. So thank you for being with us tonight. There will be a video recording of tonight's event along with the, gra the graphic recording. Uh, there will be also transcripts and a summary of today's discussions that will be posted on the VCPC website and uh, links will be sent to participants via email. 
If you need any assistance, um, just please let us know in the chat and one of our friends in the co-hosting team will help you out. Now, we will be using the chat function to share links, to respond to technical questions, but uh, we also encourage uh, your participation through comments and, um, and we'll be saving the transcript from the chat and it will be added to our uh, documentation for tonight. Now, the chat will be closely monitored and uh, so that moderators will ensure that comments uh, stay respectful. And while it's okay to disagree with the views that uh, we will be expressing during the panel, attacks, threats, and hate speech will absolutely not be tolerated. So to access, to access the chat function, you can click up or, or tap chat in your controls at the bottom of the Zoom uh, window. So please ensure that you change the chat to all participants so that all panelists and attendees can see your comments. And after we've had a chance to speak with all of the panelists, we'll be using the Q&A function to respond to the audience questions. So please enter your questions for the panelists there. And if you have seen that the question has already been asked, I would ask you to use the like button as a way of voting, and uh, we'll make sure to address those questions that have the most interest. And uh, again, just in terms of recommendations and, and agreements that we need to make with each other, please be as present as possible. Um, put away your phone, close any other tabs that you're not gonna be using. And to remind you that we welcome thoughtful questions in the Q&A. And if your question is for a particular speaker, you may type uh, and um, specify that. And again, there'll be zero tolerance for disrespectful comments for, and well, a disagreement is okay. We will not tolerate attacks, threats, or hate speech. Also, please don't assume genders, uh, uh, pronouns, and um, based on what you see on the screen. So um, we encourage you to address people by the number that they, by the name that they provide. So if you have asked the question and share the comment, make space for others so that they can also participate and um, practice self-care. If you need to take a break to stand up, have a drink of water, please make sure that you take care of yourself. Now, before the conversation gets underway, we'd like to get a feeling for why you join us this evening. So um, we we're gonna try to have a few polling questions. So Yuri, if, uh, if that's gonna work, if you can let the, launch the poll. So why did you uh, decide to attend this evening? And uh, you're welcome to use more than one um, of the options. So we'll just give a few moments for people to answer. Okay. Yuri, could you please show the result? So clearly there's a great deal of interest in this topic um, with over 81% of people. Um, and uh, also there's a great interest to learn and so grateful to um, be able to provide that space. Um, and um, also the, the panelists um, and uh, some people are bored. It's totally uh, understandable. Hopefully we'll try to keep you entertained. Um, okay. So again, thank you all for being with us today. My job as a moderator today is to keep us focused on the big question on how we could create a post-pandemic Vancouver that is just, equitable, decolonized, and inclusive for all. So under this big question, there are two other important goals for this evening, uh, which is about supporting and creating an online space for thoughtful, reflective conversations on how our city is evolving 
and uh, for bringing your ideas for what we need to be paying attention to as we look to the future of our city. This conversation is also going to help us to ground the future-oriented work of the VCPC in understanding the legacy of our colonial and racist past and present. So this is how the evening is going to go. I'll introduce the panels, uh, the panelists briefly. Each one of them will have four minutes to discuss what type of post-pandemic city we envision. Then we'll have uh, some discussion among the panelists and then we will open up the floor for discussions and invite you to uh, your questions and comments at that time. And uh, since the polls work, let's uh, maybe use another one. Um, before we introduce the panelists, we'd like to get a feeling of the mix of professions and passions of uh, the people that are joining us today. Uh, so you will see another poll in your screen. So please answer the, uh, the question and you can pick more than one question. So Yuri, please. Okay, Yuri, if uh, you can just take a couple of moments and show the results. Not seeing the results in the screen. Okay, here we go. So, a lot of people from academia, um, faculty, staff, and students. Um, um, quite a large group of people from the city of Vancouver, um, and um, a lot of uh, people in the planning and um, urban profession, and also not for profit organizations. So thank you all for your um, company tonight, and uh, we hope that you get um, a lot of um, insights on, on the dialogue that we're gonna have this evening. So we want to focus our um, conversation on the dialogue that we're gonna have amongst commissioners. Um, so we'll use an abbreviated bio, and, um, but I urge you to learn more about these commissioners on the invitation that we sent for the event and on our website and in a page that we're gonna be sharing with us. And uh, I can just tell you, I'm incredibly honored to be able to know uh, these four incredible people. Um, they're all um, people I have a lot of respect and admiration and um, really excited to be in conversation with all of you. So Sierra Tassi Baker, is the lead cultural and design consultant of Sky, Sky Spirit Consulting. Sierra is a descendant of the Squamish, Muskem, Kakawikat, Tinklit, Haida, and Hungarian chieftains and matriarchs. Hope I got that moderately right. <laughs> um, Veronica Bailikli is the executive director and co founder of CV, City Hive which is an organization uh, on a mission to transform the way that young people are engaged in civic processes, and in particular, city planning and decision making. Leslie Shea is an urban planner, designer, developer, and an academic, and her work sex, uh, seeks to bridge research and practice. And Amina Yassin is a caregiver, a daughter, sister, an auntie, a wicked dancer, and she also likes to play football, um, basketball, and she's an aspiring surfer. And on her free time, she also works as an urban planner uh, here in Metro Vancouver with a focus on anti-racism, equity, accessibility, and planning. She co-chaired the Canadian Institute of Planners Social Policy and Social Equity Committee and is a board member with the Hogan's Alley Society. I will now turn over the microphone to the panelists for, the, for their opening remarks to what they envision uh, for a post-pandemic city to look like and what needs to be done to get there. So Sierra, if you can please get us started, please. 
Uh, Chen Kuo Mantomi, thank you, Omar. Uh, halt Squile, good day, and Kayet Shten. Uh, Kayet Shten loosely translates to my hands are up to you and welcome to my territory. My name is Sierra Tassi Baker. Uh, I mainly work with Skyscraper Consulting and I'm also a commissioner on the Vancouver City Planning Commission. And I'm from the Squamish Nation, but I'm also Muskegon Kukwakiwak. Thank you for attempting <laughs> to pronounce that. Uh, Kukwakiwak. And Haida, and I'm also pro Hungarian on my mother's side. And I have my undergrad and my bachelor's in environmental design from UBC, which focuses on sustainable architecture and landscape architecture. And I have my master's in sustainable urbanism from University College London Bartlett School of Planning, which focuses on sustainable urban planning and policy. And then in both of those, I, uh, through my academic pursuits and my architectural interests, I've been working on ensuring that indig Indigenous design methodologies are included throughout the design process. And then with my company, Skyscraper Consulting, we've been working on incorporating um, different Musqueam and Squamish, which is where I'm from, and then in a larger whole Coast Salish design methodology into the planning process. So how do we ensure that um, Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh visibility is seen throughout our territories. How do we ensure that Indigenous um, across uh, Turtle Island are represented in the cities that we all inhabit now due to colonization? And a lot of my work focuses on the concept of two-eyed seeing. And two-eyed seeing is this concept uh, that was developed by Mi'kmaq Elder, which is the idea of being able to translate between Western worldviews and Indigenous ways of knowing in order to ensure that there are um, better understandings between our cultures, which are inherently at odds with each other in order to uh, start moving the conversations forward so that we can truly approach reconciliation from a decolonized lens and we can truly approach city building, planning, consulting, and so on, and engagement and meaningful engagement in ways where Indigenous people are held and upheld through design and planning processes and in ways in which Indigenous people have authority and sovereignty in our own territories for what cities should look like in our own land, especially in British Columbia, which is unceded territory. Uh, unceded means uh, never been given over, no laws, no uh, paperwork to cede over territory. So this territory is technically, by all intents and purposes, still ours. So how, as designers, as planners, um, do we recognize that by not engaging Indigenous people in these conversations, you are perpetuating colonization? So you, there is continual colonization happening on our lands. The more developers, um, construction, so on and so forth, is building in our territory without our prior informed consent, engagement and desires and will. And without asking us what we would like to see in the cities, how we would like to see our territory, how, how we would like to see um, the people provided for in our own territories. And what's incredible about our culture and our cultures is that um, what it means to be a good host means that um, the guests, our esteemed guests, feel provided, cared for, and feel that generosity and spirit of our places. So it's not a scary conversation when you start realizing that the more we position Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh visibly as the host through design, urban planning, and so on and so forth, our esteemed guests will actually have safer spaces to practice their cultures as well, because it's part of our culture to be inspired by and trade knowledge and get uh, interested and curious about other people. So how can we create beautiful safe spaces where Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh are hosts and how our esteemed guests can feel safer and happier in our shared territories? Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, and so much more to take into that conversation, but uh, we'll come back to it for sure. Um, Veronica, would, like to, would you like to go next, please? Sure. Hi, um, I'm Veronica Belitsky, and I'm joining in today from the unceded ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples, and really grateful to be a guest here on these unceded lands um, and to have grown up here. I was born and raised in Marple in South Vancouver, um, both of my parents are from Poland and immigrated to Canada a few years before I was born and um, I grew up in a uh, co-op for most of my life in, in South Vancouver and that's uh, what I consider home. Um, that's a bit about me in some other context is that I am not a, a capital P planner um, or really even a, a small P planner either for that matter but 
I do work in a lot of different intersections of city building and in particular um, making sure that youth are engaged and included in shaping what our cities look like, um, which I mainly do through City Hive. Um, and what we do is we work with and directly support civic institutions and cities to engage youth more meaningfully. Um, so transforming their engagement practices. Um, and then we also have a number of programs for youth to learn about how their cities work and to engage hands-on so that they can continue to engage over their lifetime. Um, and coming into this conversation, I'm really thinking about the cracks that COVID has revealed in our cities and how it's made more visible the inequities brought by a long legacy of anti-Black racism, colonization, and white supremacy. Um, and I'm also thinking about the ongoing call to action right now, which is not new and has been led by Black voices for a very long time. Um, and so there's no way of disentangling that uh, with conversations of city building right now or public engagement or youth engagement, like the work that I do, or when we talk about the recovery or the post pandemic world. Um, and as I'm sure many of us are feeling and have been talking about, we have an opportunity to do things really differently and to truly center anti-racism, decolonization and justice. And that call is both deeply personal and I know I'm certainly learning and, and unlearning a lot. Um, and it's also a broader call for, for all of us and I imagine all of us who are tuning in today. Um, and so going back to that initial question of um, a city that's decolonized, um, just, equitable, inclusive, um, that's a really big undertaking to think about how, how we get there. Um, and I'm still learning and, and, uh, and trying to imagine what that looks like as well. Um, and in my everyday work, um, I care about and work with systems that do and don't uphold young people. And there's so much overlap and intersection with systems that also oppress so many different marginalized communities due to their race, ability, um, socioeconomic class, citizenship status, tenureship. Um, and so as I speak to youth engagement, I also wanna make sure that I make clear that I can't speak on behalf of a generation. And also there's so many different populations of youth that have different hopes and dreams and barriers and needs. Um, but what I do wanna to speak to a bit is what we have learned at City Hive, um, why we do the work we do and, and what we've learned about how youth relate to their cities and communities. Um, and so in thinking about our post pandemic city and the just recovery, um, I think what I'm really thinking about right now is process. And I think what we end up with is really important, but it's also really important how we get there. Um, and if we don't embark on this collective imagining in a way that centers the voices of those who are most often excluded from these processes, we'll really have missed out on an opportunity to radically shift and create the post pandemic city that is more just and equitable and inclusive. Um, and I think there are a lot of uh, thinking about the work that I do. There's a lot of lessons from how we strive to engage youth that can be applied more broadly um, in terms of how we really nourish engagement. Um, and I think that really ties into um, power and how we build deep literacy and deep capacity within communities, um, who we traditionally see as the experts when we engage, um, and also um, opportunities, um, opportunities for access and how we build trust. Um, and so I think something that we really often see in our work is that um, because in our K-12 education system in BC, we don't learn about the municipal government. We learn a lot about federal and provincial governments in different ways, but we never really learn about how our cities work. And so when you turn 18, you don't really know, you know, what the mayor does, what your city is responsible for, um, and you don't necessarily um, see yourself or, or get to know um, what your power is within that system. And so I think um, something that we really need to think about um, as we think about engaging deeply is how we build that capacity and literacy um, and also making sure that we um, that we uh, look at specific barriers to access um, and think about how we can tackle those specific barriers rather than generalizing um, and, and trying to make engagement work for everyone which which hasn't traditionally worked um, maybe I'll, I'll wrap it up there but um, yeah I think this this question around reimagining how we distribute power, how we deeply invest in communities' capacity, um, how we create access are all pretty tall orders. Um, but I think that I'm really excited and inspired by the work of my fellow panelists, others on the um, commission, and I'm sure a lot of people who are tuning in today. Um, and I think this moment calls us all in for a really deep reimagining. Thank you, Veronica. And uh, yeah, I can also attest uh, with my work in the not-for-profit sector, um, the fact that there is not a, a deep relationship between 
organizations and their government officials is something that um, that needs to change. And uh, so many times, uh, government officials uh, and uh, many planners also, when they get to hear from organizations that are working on these issues, it's refreshing rather than having to hear from, um, you know, corporate or energy or other sectors that uh, don't carry the kind of um, moral compass that so many of the communities that we work with also carry. So thank you for that work. Uh, Leslie, would you like to go next, please? You're, you're muted, Leslie. Yeah, so um, yeah, so good evening. Um, it's, it's an honor to be here with the panel with Sierra, Veronica, and Nina. Um, I'm the co-founder of Tomo Spaces, a research-driven development firm in Vancouver. Many of our projects are grounded in the principle of bringing people together, that we are better together. So a, t a question that's been top of mind for us is how do we do this with social bubbles, distancing, and this growing fear of strangers? Um, in our project team, we recently discussed possible scenarios as our economy begins to open and we adjust to a new way of life. I'd like to share these four scenarios with you this evening. Um, I'd like to preface by saying that the scenarios are not forecast. They're not meant to predict the future, but to frame what we are experiencing personally and observing in social discourses, market reports, consumer behaviors. Uh, the scenario stories help us discuss uncertainties, um, imagine multiple futures, multiple possible futures and consider what um, how each would mean for our work. Um, so the first scenario that we came up with is um, almost business as usual. So in the long term, we return largely to the way things were. After 9-11, after the 2008 economic downturn to recent crisis, cities recovered, though some of the control and surveillance measures stayed and we adapted. Um, scenario two, uh, it's a smaller world. Families who are thinking of moving out of the city to smaller communities now have the impetus to do so. People are shopping online, um, supporting local neighborhood businesses. Grassroots efforts of mutual care bring food to more vulnerable neighbors who are isolated at home. We're cautious, we're wary of visitors from outside our community. In this smaller world, we are supported by technology. We have virtual meetings, we have parties, we're virtual parties. Um, we are purchasing online for delivery or curbside pickup. Uh, small city, uh, smart city technologies help with contact tracing and um, smart city technologies become more ubiquitous in our everyday life. A third scenario um, we call winner takes all. So there are clear winners and losers in this pandemic. The pandemic has highlighted the inequalities and failures in our systems. Some people are struggling financially and mentally, some are doing well. In this scenario, it is a zero sum game where competition is better than cooperation. Um, in our fourth scenario, we call truer democracy. We don't, go, we don't want to go back to the, things, um, the way things were. We don't become disoriented and panicked and vulnerable to crisis exploitation, to short-sighted decisions that erode our democracy. We draw on our collective intelligence and innovation we take deliberate actions and consider effort to remake our city to be more equitable, just, and inclusive. And we are intentional about our commitment to organizational and systemic shift. And in our recovery and healing alternatives, um, radical ideas that were perhaps thought impossible are possible. So these scenarios simply offer um, a platform for our discussion. And there no, there's no limit to the stories we could tell about the future. And so I look forward to this evening's discussion and hearing your views. Thank you, Leslie. And uh, yeah, I mean, so often getting to know you and uh, having the different view of what a developer, a developer is and the curiosity, the, the the value that you have for society and for bringing people together uh, is being truly commendable and the kind of projects that you, you work on are really, really admirable. So thank you for all of that. Curiosity and um, smart um, approach that you bring to your work. So, thank you. And uh, Amina, would you like to go next, please? Sure. Um, so I'm just gonna do a quick 
screen share while I do my intro. Oh, is, has it been disabled? Screen screen sharing? It has it. Eh? Okay. Yeah. No worries. Um, okay, so um, thank you for having me here, first and foremost. Uh, thank you to my hosts, the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish. How I come into this conversation today, I come towards it as a Black woman living at the intersections of many identities, as coined by Professor Crenshaw and introduced in her work on the multiple oppressions, displacements, and communicide faced by Black people. In my work as an urban planner, it is clear that historically, globally, and in many instances presently during COVID-19, urban planning and urbanism have been weaponized as a tool to impact many groups, including Black people, Indigenous communities, single mothers in gentrification, women in public spaces, Muslims in public spaces, members of the Two-Spirit LGBTQT community, and those living with disabilities, including mental health and cognitive challenges, as well as other racialized communities. As Black people, we exist at the intersections of all of these realities and are but one of numerous groups impacted by discriminatory land use policies, ordinances, and regulations. Anti-Blackness does not and has never existed in isolation in Canada, particularly the way policy, zoning, and land use planning has developed in and across Canada and impacted Black communities, specifically low-income Black communities. The field of urban planning and Canada have something in common. They both have a race problem that they have not wanted to confront for over a century, and we are seeing these issues manifest in the ways that Black citizens and supporters have taken to the streets to take back their streets and their city. We have also seen this in the ways that it has manifested in cities across not only Canada, but the United States, and also in the United Kingdom and Australia. So this is quite global. When it comes to urban planning, 2019 marked the centenary year of the profession in Canada, in Canada with very little change and or reform. More than ever, it is time to reassess, reimagine, and most importantly, respond to the call to consider the possibility of planning in ways in a post-COVID situation that counter and deconstruct racism, policing, and European and colonial spatial imaginaries. More importantly, before we move forward discussing and developing a post-pandemic city, we need to acknowledge that we still haven't addressed the legacy of racism in planning in this city, across Canadian cities, and across cities in the United States including in planning education, the planning accreditation process, and within planning departments themselves. Moreover, in this city, region, and, prom and province, we have yet to address what happened to Hogan's Alley, a predominantly Black community that was expelled and raised by an inefficient piece of infrastructure that we have recognized today needs to be removed. Part of failing to address this reality is that the community hasn't even received the bare minimum of an apology and recognition of what happened. Thank you, Mia. And um, yeah, definitely thinking of uh, something that compels so many of us is just reimagining what a uh, better future could look like, what um, what um, equitable justice could be could be like for so many people that don't get to participate um, because of. Um, uh, physical abilities, um, race, economic position, etc. So I'm wondering, just in terms of uh, starting a conversation in a more fluid way, um, what would you like to see in a post-pandemic city? Um, and if, uh, you know, like if we go with a bit of some of uh, utopia, what, would, what could that look like? Um, I wonder if I can start with uh, Leslie. What would you think that a post-pandemic city that is just equitable um, and inclusive could look like? And uh, you're muted still, Leslie. 
Um, so yeah, so in preparing for in, in thinking about this topic, um, I've been thinking about how I think we're in some of our discussions that uh, we just we need to be well. One, I feel like we have a lot of um, anecdotal um, evidence of like what would be better. So there's been a lot of talk about um, like we need wider streets or we need density or we need to rethink our density. But I feel like we um, I would I would like to have um, uh, like a more a nuanced discussion about. Um, what does it is not just um, like about density in general, but maybe we need to talk about diverse housing types. So, so I, I like to see us having a more nuanced discussions about um, about um, about these bigger topic that we say what by just simply saying oh we need to rethink density, but but to really have that nuanced discussion, and then to help us with that nuanced dis discussion, I think we really need to have more data. Um, I think this pandemic has also shown that we need um, more localized data um, that also reflects um, some of the um, um, some of the race data that that are that is that is truly missing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely, and maybe also acknowledging that uh, culturally. There are different preferences for how we want to live, whether we want to live alone, whether we want to live in community and uh, creating space for those differences to be manifested is something that our physical environments don't always um, allow. So, so yeah. Um, Sierra, I'm wondering if uh, you have uh, further thoughts on what um, this post-pandemic city could look like for you. Okay, I think we, we lost your, um, Veronica, would you like to address that? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think there is um, a lot comes to mind when I think about what I'd want our city to look like um, post pandemic and especially or as we transition out of the pandemic and um, especially the invitation to think in a um, kind of utopic way, um, I could probably get a bit carried away. Um, but I think thinking about um, kind of echoing what I what I said earlier, I'm really thinking about process um, and what that looks like post pandemic and and also as we talk about the just recovery um, and uh, and the process of actually getting to that state, I, I guess part of my response could be, you know, who am I to say what that post pandemic city looks like, but how do we really make sure that we're um, centering voices that have been traditionally excluded um, in shaping what that looks like. Um, and I think to maybe to get a bit more um, on the ground level, I think um, one thing that really comes to mind is around um, who we traditionally see as experts in shaping and what they, they need. And I think a lot of what we've seen in the response to COVID um, were a lot of community organizing efforts and a lot of um, organizations that were really on the ground that were um, a part of uh, um, really responding and making sure that we were uh, resilient and, and bouncing back. And so I think I'd love to see, um, I'd love to see us shift towards a model where we really do tap into communities and are talking to people about what they need and what their fears are and, um, and what their hopes are um, and, and move to that from a, a model where we do um, ask people about specific, um, or we engage with people on specific um, projects and, and perhaps areas where they might not I feel like they have the expertise to, to show up. So I think I'd really love to see us shifting towards a, a place where we do work with community on engaging um, with what they with what they need and, and shifting from um, that that concept of, of folks feeling like perhaps I'm not an expert to engage to offering what they know from their lived experience or from the model of I don't belong um, in this engagement process to I do belong. Um, and I think a lot of that goes to uh, connects with issues and, and opportunities to build um, trust um, and also sharing power. Yeah, thank you, Veronica. And yeah, I have also seen the, um, the kind of wisdom that we can gain where we can provide spaces where people that don't feel like they have the expertise uh, to share their own experience and knowledge, uh, how that actually serves to address uh, solutions that we wouldn't have imagined before. So um, making space for that is uh, really wonderful. Um, Sierra, is that you in the telephone line? Yes, uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. 
Okay, great. Good great. to have you back. Yeah, that's fine. So maybe I'll ask the question to Amina so you have some time to think about it. But uh, just going back and reflecting on, uh, yeah, like in some utopic kind of way, but, you know, why would it be a utopic? But what would you imagine to be this post-pandemic city, which is um, more equitable and, and accessible? So for me, um, the first part would be to sort of understand, you know, uh, where we've come from and who we are right now. Um, you, in your opening, you, you indicated that COVID-19, we know from other cities at least, has disproportionately affected um, racialized, um, disabled people and people who are, who are more low income um, and on the margins within our, within our cities. So the first point of order is, is why has it taken us this long to realize that we need disaggregated data in this region? Why is it that every time communities um, present this information and this reality that they are being disproportionately affected the onus is on them to fight to be heard, you know, and to validate and almost perform their pain through storytelling, which is deeply problematic, I find, um, through ane anecdotal storytelling. Um, and we, we have enough data. We know, we know a lot, you know. Uh, cities don't differ that drastically, which is why we do a lot of copy and paste urban planning. <laughs> Things are not that drastically different in Toronto. <laughs> Um, and we know that in Toronto, the data shows that it is mostly racialized Black members of our communities who are being affected. Um, and so we need to be able to collect race-based data. That's the first point of order. And the only reason that we even need to collect race-based data is because, unfortunately, the status quo, you know, doesn't want to look to the data that already exists. And so, again, that onus is put back on. So I'm very happy to see... Um, you know, that the city of Vancouver and New Westminster and et cetera have put forward motions um, to collect race-based data um, and disaggregate that race-based data because historically in Canada as well, we've done a lot of hiding of this stuff, you know, under coded language. And so people like you and myself, Omar, are considered visible minorities. And what does that even mean? And the United Nations has come out and already declared that that in and of itself is an inequity that in and of itself is racialized and coded and problematic and is the way that that Canada and cities in Canada have circumvented this process of having to deal with the most marginalized groups and its population. And so, yeah, we need, we need to be moving forward with motions like disaggregated data. You know, it's not, it's not an ask that is silly, especially when we're seeing very specific groups in other cities uh, being affected. And these groups are not being affected because there are inherent things that um, exist within their cultures or their ethnic, you know, makeup or whatever way you want to frame that, you know, they're more likely to bear the brunt of public health issues because of the built environment, because of how planners have built and where, where they've built and who they've built for. And so wealth and health are two things that we cannot separate. And so there's a reason why wealthy communities have been insulated. There's a reason why in my article, I ask us to know our roles and, and, and look at the privileges that each of us has. And so, you know, we're seeing um, rapid changes made for prioritized citizens. You know, uh, people uh, disabled people have been asking for accommodations in work environments. Disabled people have been asking for accommodations in the built environment. We don't have the equivalent of um, the Accessibility Act that they have in the United States. So the onus comes down to the individual planner. The onus comes down to the bias of the individual planner. So if an individual planner thinks that aesthetics, aesthetics are more important than human rights, I think I could ask an individual planner about the human rights code and they would know nothing. And yet that is a regulation that circumvents zoning, that circumvent that, that you know, that trumps uh, zoning, uh, official community plans. And so it's almost taboo 
to even bring that up when you're sitting in a room and seeing bias present itself. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have tangible things that we can do. We've always been able to do it. COVID is not the opportunity. I don't like the framing of that. It is not an opportunity. We knew how to do this. We knew how to ensure and be proactive that this is not the space and place that we would have been in. But we made accommodations for the middle class because that's, that's the class of people that we value. We made accommodations for the wealthy who are able to flee and go to vacation homes. And now you've got rural communities who are saying, wait a minute, these urbanists, you know, are, are, are flooding into our communities or whatever it might be, right? So we have to have some really hard conversations and it's not a utopia. It's a, you know, yeah. we've always had the answers. Indeed. And I think it's also important to um, acknowledge our own response as planners when we um, want to uh, hear from, um, say, equity seeking communities, uh, a response like, oh, we're going to go and do some consultation. And then we've already heard all of the stories. We just want, we want an apology. We want to be reflective. We don't want more dialogue. We just want that to be acknowledged. But, you know, we have systems of law. We have unconscious personal biases that uh, we need to be, you know, aware, made aware of for ourselves. So, so much more um, to dig from there. And also the fact that what gets measured gets done, and it's uh, something that happens a lot with the sustainability sort of um, aspect of, uh, um, you know, cities and uh, companies. Um, unless you measure, there's no changes. Um, Sierra, would you like to address that question as well? Yes, sorry, do you mind repeating? I, my internet has been exciting. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're basically reflecting on um, what, um, what this post-pandemic city should look like. And, and, you know, I was kind of posing it, uh, like, what would a utopic post-pandemic city could look like? But Sierra is also reflecting how it doesn't need to be utopic. It's just a matter of what, what's so, what's right. Thank you. Yeah, I, I really want to honor what Amina is saying in the sense of um, this, because of this pandemic, that's not the framing of this being the, the best time to suddenly start pushing for all of these equity seeking groups. Um, it, it, like Amina said, like we've already, we have the TRC report, we have the MMW report, we have the calls to action, we have the United Nations Declaration of Rights for Indigenous people. Like, all of the paperwork has been done. Uh, everything that has currently needed to be said has been said. And it's, uh, by this point, it's, we're just front face and center with um, colonization. We're front face and center with white supremacy. And uh, for example, like, I mean, I myself, we're every single day facing a barrier, every single day facing um, an excuse or facing um, a missed opportunity or a improperly contextualized uh, opportunity. And we have to recontextualize, we have to reword, we have to educate our clients, we have to start decolonizing this language uh, just to get to the table to be able to get creative. A lot of what I'm trying to do is train my clients and train the city and train people to get to the point where I can start being creative, to the point where my people can start being creative. I want to get to that point where it's utopic um, and even reading the book utopia is very interesting like the concept of utopia in, in and of itself um, i remember uh, a scene in the book where um in utopia uh the marginalized groups wear all the gold and wear all the wealth and all the wealthy people are have nothing um <laughs> so utopia in and of itself isn't perfection it's uh looking at and having a different lens and ensuring that we're critiquing the way that we govern ourselves and experience governance, ensure that we are constantly critiquing um, the ways that we've decided to govern these cities because Vancouver is only 200-ish years old. Um, I normally have the date memorized, but it's the city is so young. And if you start realizing, for example, in my family, we've been here for over 809 generations. That's over 16,000 to 80,000 years of continued uh, land stewardship of my family. Like my family, we have specific legends of how we survived the Ice Age, specific legends of how my specific family um, survived the Great Flood. And that's incredible. And just think about the wisdom in that. 
And then think about how patronizing it is to constantly be requesting and asking for our power back. And when people are constantly not asking our opinion on things, when actually we have over 80,000 years of knowledge of this territory and knowledge about how to govern and how to have safe communities and how to create safe, beautiful spaces and how to live in a utopic, um, let's be critical of that word, but in a utopic way. And um, by utopic ways, to us, I would recontextualize that as uh, living in a way where you can relate to everything around you. So this concept of all my relations comes into play. I'm sure some of you have heard uh, the concept of all my relations, but my interpretation is that um, I know who I am, so and you know who you are, so we can share that with each other. And then because of that, I can relate to you. And because I would know how to relate to myself and therefore relate to the land, I know how to ensure that I can help you relate to my land. And then by being able to be in all of my relations, we're able to come forward and move forward in a really good way that's very grounded and structured and rooted in what this land has the capacity to provide for and what it doesn't. So by being able to always be in relation to each other, you're creating harmonious relationships, which gets into this um, critical concept of utopic. And uh, again, to get back to the patronizing um, aspect of, of living um, my everyday career, uh, career <laughs> life goal of decolonizing the city and constantly coming up against um, internalized racism, internalized misogyny, internalized so on and so forth. And I understand where those mechanisms come from because I've done my research into the origins of colonial history. Um, often you're walking around the city and you don't realize why you prefer a blank modern building over like a beautiful piece of um, like ornamented, like gorgeous and wild and, you know, like, and that comes from, I know what book that comes from, that comes from Ornament and Crime written in 1908 by Adolf Luce, where he argued that uh, to ornament oneself and he likened ornamentation to Papua New Guinea uh, women's tattooing techniques. So visibly um, black indigenous women, he said ornamentation is to be akin to being criminal. So Adolf Luce, who's known as the father of modernism and modern architecture, um, likened ornamentation, which is actually um, obviously to our cultures, an incredibly nuanced way of relating to the land and, and so on and so forth. It's about our legal laws, it's about our ways of knowing, blah, blah, blah. Um, he likened all of that to, to crime. So it's actually a crime to have um, beautiful walls and ornamentation in city spaces and to showcase and celebrate opulence of culture. And he advocated for a cigarette box as being the epitome of design. So we end up with all these cigarette box white wall spaces, all these cigarette box um, towers and buildings. And suddenly we're like, why, why do I feel sick walking around the city? Well, we're literally living in a cigarette box that was the imagination of the perfect world by this one architect. And then at that time as well, in the um, 1800s, I mean, essentially from 1400s to today, it's been celebrated that if you can um, associate um, wildness, dehumanization, like certain design aspects with blackness, with indigeneity, with the wild, then that's a crime, that's criminal, that don't do that, that's, that's worse practice. And then moving forward to today, you then uh, are celebrating these cigarette box buildings and celebrating clean slate sanitized spaces, which are highly traumatizing for black and indigenous bodies to walk into. And if you consider, for example, uh, Indigenous people who've gone through residential schools or the foster care system, when you're designing these blank, clean slate, modern spaces, that's actually a very unsafe space for Indigenous people, not because it feels uncomfortable, but it was literally designed to be against our cultural practices. So myself, being Musqueam and Squamish and walking around the city is very difficult for me because I literally look at all of these buildings and all the streets and the way our city has been designed and I know that it's not accidentally racist. I know it's very intentionally over time. And because of the way that planning is taught and the way that academia is taught, um, and there's all these examples of books like Ornament and Crime in different fields all across the board in health sciences and psychology and um, color theory actually, and so much more that is very similar in process. So you end up with these cities that are literally built and based on racist um, ideologies. And as an Indigenous person trying to decolonize that, 
I'm not just decolonizing the city, I'm decolonizing the thinking that got us there because we're continuing that and perpetuating that every single day that we don't look back on these originating ideals and we don't critique them. And what's incredible now is, to, for example, you have Amina and other indigenous and black architects and urban planners finally joining in the field, finally having our voices being uplifted and amplified. We're now able to say, let's not do this. <laughs> this is a bad idea. <laughs> it was always a bad idea. Let's rethink, let's reconnect, let's um, figure out how we can celebrate and uplift each other. And a beautiful Skohoma's teaching is chen chen sui, which means to uplift and uphold each other. So how can we exhibit chen chen sui through design of our cities? And we do honestly have to start with a decolonized practice before we can get there. Right now, I walk around the city and I'm upset and it's difficult and traumatizing for me to literally just walk down the street. What I would love as my utopia is being able to walk down the street and feel joy and relief and just feel like I can exist safely in space, um, which isn't technically a lot to ask for, but it is in, in the context of Vancouver. So. Yeah, and so many cities. I mean, and so, I mean, we're just scratching the surface of so many conversations here. And um, yeah, just even the aspect of all my relations, so much that we have lost, and you and I were talking about this earlier on, um, where we actually don't know who were those relationships because they were, our systems were designed to separate us from, from them and our, how our built environments also separates us from each other. And we know that the single most important aspect of health and well-being is social connection. And now we have this um, crisis that actually the best thing that we can do for each other is to stay physically separated from each other, but how can we stay connected? And uh, just, uh, we probably have maybe time for two questions because um, uh, we're running out of time. So Alisa, I'm wondering if you can, um, uh, if you have any um, questions that you have seen that people have put in the Q and A that uh, you could to post right now. Yeah, um, I think there's two near the top of the voting list that are talking about engagement. Um, and I think I can mush them together here. So much of public consultation uh, that is demanded by the city to be done is currently dominated by either wealth, white wealthy homeowners or those that have the time and capacity to participate. So how might we begin to change engagement requirements um, so that we can get the results of listening to the groups and people that need to be heard and the data they already have provided for us? Mm -hmm. Veronica, would you like to take a crack at that and maybe think about youth also in ways in which they are able to participate or not? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, but first, if, if anybody else has something that they wanna throw in first, I've talked a bit about engagement. I'm happy to jump in after. I can speak. Um, yeah, we've been having a lot of conversations around this, um, especially with MODIS, which is a great uh, engagement consulting practice, and having a lot of conversations around um, changing the wording from hard to reach to seldom heard and trying to figure out the translations and um, just the inherent biases we have. And I was speaking a bit about it earlier. Is, when we approach engagement, it's often in a patronizing way. It's often in, we just wanna kind of hear from you. Whereas at Sky Spirit, what we really try and do is ensure that we, we have trace and maps and designs and actually put it on the table and ensure that the people that we're talking to feel like what they're gonna say and put on that piece of paper is actually going to affect the design at the end of the day, which is very respectful of people's time. And I've been at a lot of different engagements where my time was not respected and especially if you start thinking about ancestral protocol, like we have protocols for genuine meaningful engagement. It's centuries and centuries old. Um, but just to be able to even get to that point, we have so much of reconciliation and decolonization to, to start doing. But to begin that journey, um, if you are starting this decolonization journey, um, thinking about time in and of itself is an interesting translation. Often when engaging with the seldom heard, um, we have a complete, it's on the indigenous side, we have a completely different relationship with time. And often if you're applying a project timeline to indigenous people, and it can actually cause genuine harm to the community. If you're implying a rigid structure, rigid deliverables, uh, you're inherently going to tokenize the people you're speaking with. So by 
I'm going to make up a word really quickly, de-rigifying uh, your timeline, blurring those lines, ensuring that there's a lot of time for check-in, a lot of time for check-back, a lot of time for agency with the people you're speaking with. Um, you're going to start that process of ensuring that you're not causing harm to communities by sticking to a tokenized, check the box, diverse, um, I'm definitely critical of diversity by this point, because if you have a diverse group of people you're talking to, is that just visually diverse? Or are you actually giving agency to, to those people in a way that when they actually apply a pen to paper, um, you're reflecting different cultures in throughout your design process. You're reflecting a genuine respect for different people's cultures and approaches and ways of learning and ways of engaging and ways of communicating. And if engagement is, is only expected to be one way and one direction, and at the end of that engagement, you said, oh, we couldn't get a hold of them, so we didn't include them. That's an excuse. You go back to the drawing board, try again. Um, because if you really want to make sure that you're engaging the right voices, you're going to be able to find them. You're going to build those relationships to find them and be very respectful. Um, and one quick comment before I, I stop speaking is oftentimes, um, we want to ensure that on the Indigenous side, our elders are being heard. However, you need to ensure that you're respecting those elders and their time. I often have clients who very demandingly say, can I have that elder's contact? And it's like, absolutely not, like, <laughs> no way. Or very demanding of, I need someone to do a land acknowledgement, you have to find them for me. Like, no, like that's not where we're going with this. It's um, applying that, what that is, it, that comes from white guilt, essentially, that like, oh, I need to do this right. Okay, I really, like, you're checking boxes again, you're, you're ticking boxes again, you're making deliverables again for what your reconciliation or engagement is going to look like. So undo that. A decolonized engagement is going to feel like a sigh of relief. A decolonized engagement practice is going to feel like things are going at a slow and steady pace, because you want to do things in the right way. And what does that mean to truly think about the right way? Like we're going to do this in the right way. If you set that intention, it should take as long as it needs to. Um, and if you don't have the budget for it, you don't have the timeline for it. We as Indigenous people, we're here, we're still here, we'll always be here. We're not rushing this. We want to make sure this is done in the right way. And I appreciate the momentum that's been happening with the Black Lives Matter movement. It's been helping uh, Indigenous people as well. Through all this, people are starting to think about um, think about things differently, but it's really important that we we take time to pause and reflect and recuperate and process and processing time is so important in my culture. So how can you design in processing time into your engagement practices. Hmm. Right, thank you. Thank you, Sierra. Um, it is 808. I'm gonna ask the panelists if you're okay to stay for an extra 10 minutes and um, if people uh, need to log off, um, please feel free to do so. It feels like an important conversation um, to, to have at this moment. Um, so I'm just gonna say that we're going to end at 825. Um, and um, again, um, the people need to sign off, uh, really appreciate your company today, um, but we're just going to spend a little bit of more time with, with each other here. Um, so uh, Amina, you wanted to say a few words and maybe we'll ask uh, Veronica next. Yeah, I just want to co-sign everything that Sierra has said. Um, and a lot of it applies applies to deeply marginalized um, communities as well. And so there's a lot of trust. Um, there's a lack of trust, obviously, with uh, city departments and indigenous groups, but also city departments and low-income neighborhoods. Um, for example, growing up in Toronto, <laughs> I never met a single city planner where I grew up. You know what I mean? They just never came to certain neighborhoods. Um, um, you know, I, <laughs> if you ask most city planners, they work at their desks right and they're not really embedded in the community but also they don't get to choose if they get embedded they have to be invited and too often we invite ourselves i think and it's about the rush and the timelines of white supremacy but yet we use terms like reconciliation which i find is ironic because we haven't even gotten to conciliation with any group we haven't even started that first stage um and you know that applies as well to hogan's alley um, but yeah, when I worked in um, northern uh, Alberta and 
in uh, Fort Chip, uh, Fort Chippewa, with the uh, Dene people and the Chippewa people. It was there was a lot of like flying in and building relationships and a lot of sort of understanding that it was going to be a lot of listening. And I might be going in to discuss one thing, but they might be still upset by something that another city department has done. And because city departments are so siloed off and we don't talk to each other, that's one big issue going into a community is the community might be having a problem with the piece of public art, you know, that was decided would be put in place for them, right? But I may be going in for, I don't know, um, a discussion about a development or the census or something like that, because um, in Alberta, they do their own censuses. And so trying to sort of work on, on uh, the timelines of the community that you're working with, trying to respect um, the time that you're being given, but also understanding that you're going to have to make a couple of trips. And you're going to have to build relationships with people. We don't spend time building relationships. We're planning for, we're not planning with, and that's a big problem. That's part of that colonial and racist planning. And so it's shocking to me when people are shocked that planning is racist. I'm like, how could you be shocked? You know, you're on unceded land and we live in a province called British Columbia where the British built their wealth on the enslavement of African people. Um, so how can this not be a racist and colonial yeah. process it absolutely is and so building relationships i think is a very very important step and there's more in my article i see that it's been posted a couple of times about um, what other measures could be taken yeah yeah i'm actually wondering whether instead of uh, calling it engagement and consultation we called it relationship building and how would that change our perspective of what we're actually going to do veronica yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I have much to add. Um, Sierra and, and Amina both, um, yeah, shared everything so eloquently and I absolutely echo everything they've shared. Um, I think, um, yeah, definitely it was shared around, um, Sierra, how you how you said that a decolonized process is really a sigh of relief. Like I felt that, um, and I think, I've, yeah, I felt the inverse of that, of feeling really crunched for time and having to organize and design a process that engages a certain number of youth in a deep way in a very short timeline. Um, and luckily, in, in our case, we have some of those relationships already built, but it still means that we can't do it in a, you know, in a deep way and really make sure that we do follow through um, and, and can have as much transparency along the way. Um, and so, yeah, that really resonates with the need to have that, to have a, a decolonized process. Um, and um, one thing that comes to mind is just around um, in, a, in a traditional, um, traditional engagement planning process where perhaps there's a wide invitation to attend and you know who chooses to to show up both based on time um and and those sorts of more structural um either um barriers or ways that people do can access those opportunities um but also who feels like they have you know the power to show up and who feels like they are going to be heard and like they need to and should be heard um and i think often um I guess I, I can speak mostly to, to um, my work with youth, and this is youth up to the age of 30, so including young adults um, who often feel like they actually um, aren't invited to show up, or if they do show up, then they won't actually know about enough about the content or don't have the expertise. Um, and then often, I think, have experiences of having shown up in a process, but not seeing that transparency, and then that trust is broken. And I think that's part of the equation is that trust take such a long time to build, but can be broken so quickly. And, um, and, uh, and so I think it speaks to the power of, of really working on those um, relationships in the long term. Um, and I think um, a story to share is that we, a few years ago, organized a, a workshop where we brought youth to, to City Hall to witness a city council meeting and then to meet some city councillors and staff. Um, and we had over 60 youth show up who were just curious and we pulled them afterwards and almost um, all but one had never been to a city council meeting and most of them didn't even know that city hall was a public building. Um, and I think that's a really specific example um, with city hall. I think city hall also represents a lot of different things, um, but I think it also speaks to how we see that our systems do or don't work for us. And I think if we don't get that invitation at a, at a young age as well or have negative experiences at a younger age, then those of course extend over our lifetime. Um, and so I think going back to the to the question of what um, 
how we can really work on that meaningful engagement. I do think that a lot of it does start young. Um, and I do think a lot of it also starts um, in meeting youth where they're at, whether that's school, whether it's um, extracurriculars, whether it's um, neighborhood groups, um, what, whatever it is, uh, meeting youth where they're at. Thank you, Veronica. And yeah, I just reflect on what the city of Vancouver had um, done with the Vancouver plan and the results that they got from their first uh, widespread um, survey and the sense of um, lack of trust in the future of the city. It, they were really troubling results. That was even before the pandemic. So I wonder the, the sentiment that people have right now. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, I just want to add to what's been said about um, engagement. And I, I, and I think it's really important not to forget that um, capacity building is a large part of engagement. Um, and that we're not, sim we're not simply seeking opinions, but that that in the process of community engagement, we are um, that we that that not to forget that capacity building needs to happen. Um, so that it isn't always just one way. Um, we're really focusing on that in our work. Um, I'm, I'm a member of the Chinatown Stewardship or Legacy Stewardship Group, and that's something that we're that we're really focusing on is um, capacity building. Yeah, and sometimes, like uh, I think Veronica was saying, just even the permission that people have the ability to speak up and making space for all of that. So. I think uh, we're going to do one last round of um, two, three sentences of final conclusion, and um, and then we'll go with uh, with um, Patricia, I believe. Um, so, I mean, uh, just last two thoughts that you'd like to share to our time together today. I mean, yeah, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, so last thoughts. Um, COVID is not an opportunity. Let's stop uh, referring to it as an opportunity. I think that's harmful language. Um, we've known what to do. Um, we have the people with us who have been speaking to these concerns um, for quite some time now. Um, my article lists quite a few. Uh, we need to use an anti-racist lens on all of our policies. We can do that. We need to understand what anti-racism means. When we speak about anti-racism, we should not perpetuate the continual exclusion of the Black community because anti-racism work can do that when we just focus on very specific groups and don't speak about anti-Black racism. Anti-Black racism is what people have taken to the streets for. Anti-Black racism is what we're seeing being protested um, with regards to, and anti-Indigenous um, sentiments as well. When we see people take to streets, they have opened the streets on their own. They didn't need the city to do it for them. They didn't need the city to force it on them. They didn't need technocrats to tell them that this is this is the innovation that they need to lead healthier lives. They took to the streets and they took their streets back. And these monuments that we have glorified, um, and we've seen this across cities, what is the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, Belgium, Canada, America, all have in common? You know, these are the questions that we need to ask ourselves. Why are people taking down statuary in Belgium? What's the story there? How is that connected to the built environment? And so decolonizing has to do with that. And part of white supremacy are the systems and hoops that we have to go through to beg to be able to exist in public spaces and come out of it alive at the end of a walk, at the end of buying groceries. Here in Vancouver, we have names like Maxwell Johnson and his granddaughter. You know, we have Jamil Moore, who was assaulted for crossing the streets, for crossing the streets. And yet it's the city of Vancouver and city of New Westminster that's gonna open streets and make it safer for us without understanding racism and, and how colonialism works and that urban planning is racist and colonial. 
Justin McElroy came out with figures that said every single Metro Vancouver City department is led by a white person. That is colonial planning. They are colonial planners still. And so maybe we should change the title from urban planner to colonial planner until we start getting this right. Until we start digging into the reality of what our what our planning departments look like today. Thank you, Luna. Um, Veronica. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, first off, thanks to um, Amina, Sierra, and Leslie, um, and, and to you, Omar, for hosting as well, um, but especially for a lot of, I think, teachings and, um, and yeah, for a lot of the work and, and spaces that you, yeah, just do a lot of work in beyond, beyond uh, this here today. Um, and um, I think I'm thinking about how, um, how a lot of, a lot of what felt really impossible became possible overnight in terms of behavioral change, policy changes, um, and the way that our, you know, all levels of society had to reconfigure overnight. And I think I'm thinking about how that, um, and I appreciate your kind of call, Amina, that it's to not frame things as an opportunity um, and how harmful that language is. Um, but I think thinking about what we can learn from this time um, and, and carry going forward. Um, and yeah, I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, thank you, Veronica. Leslie. You're muted. Um, really enjoyed tonight's conversation. Um, right now, I'm um, thinking about um, like actions <laughs> and um, and concrete actions we can take. Yeah, and then also to remind ourselves of uh, what Sierra was saying that sometimes just staying and processing things is also part of an important aspect of where we need to sit. Um, Sierra, I know that you uh, fell off the internet again, but I think you're in the phone. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Great, yes. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is what happens when you're uh, speaking from a red-lined zone and community in Vancouver. Anyways, uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. It's, it's a huge honor to speak with the panel, and in particular, it's a huge honor to speak with Amina. I think it's really incredible that the Black and Indigenous communities are uh, through this movement, starting to speak together and, and starting to find commonalities and ways to, to work together and move forward, because both of us, both of our communities are, are right front and center dealing with colonization and anti-Black racism and racism uh, in Canada. And it's a really good point to start really thinking about um, why do we use the past tense when we talk about colonization? Why do we use the past tense when we talk about racism? when actually in Canada, there's continued colonization and continued and ongoing racism, and it's still inherent in policy. And what's great about policy is it can be changed. Policy can be edited and rewritten. Uh, what's great about government and governing systems is that we can make amendments, we can change how we think about governing. And what's great about cities in the built form is that you can uh, tear things down and build things back up again. Um, there's a lot of ingenuity and resources and as um, as we were saying, the capacity building, I think, is so important. Um, I'm a result of my family ensuring that our family had enough capacity building to send me to school. Um, I'm definitely, my existence as an Indigenous urban planner is in spite of colonization. Um, and being able to do what I can do is really exciting, but I want more Indigenous urban planners. I want more black urban planners. I want more um, more of our voices, uh, the seldom heard voices to start being the leaders in these conversations. And I really want to start seeing um, the Musqueam and Squamish and Tsleil Waututh people upheld. And I want it to be very obvious for in the future for every single person visiting our territory that this is our territory and that we welcome you. But we can't be good hosts until we get our house back. <laughs> you know, um, and so we build our own tables and then we can invite you to them. And that's a beautiful relationship and a good relationship that I want to work towards. 
and we're not there yet, but by having these conversations, um, we're on our way. So Hoishka and San Clement told me, and San Clement told me, yeah, thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Zira. And uh, yeah, just like we said, um, it's about relationship building and um, throwing away our timeline. So we're way over uh, our a lot of times. So what we want to see in the VCPCs to model the kind of behavior and things that we want our cities to follow that for a variety of reasons, um, cities like the city of Vancouver may not be ready to model the behavior that we want to see in our cities, but we're citizens and uh, we can model things that we'd like our communities to reflect. So um, I just would like to ask um, Patricia if you can quickly share your screen to um, see um, some of the conversation that you captured today. Hello? Yes, hi Patricia. So um, I had a bit of technical difficulty, so I've only got a piece of it. The rest I had to take um, handwritten and I'll, I'll have to, this will just be the first process and then, uh, and then I'll have to get that to you in the morning. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Thank you. So um, it's been such an honor, um, such a privilege, and I feel uh, ever so grateful when I get to um, have these kind of conversations with my fellow commissioners, uh, people with whom I have all kinds of respect and affinity and uh, with whom I learned so much from. So um, I'm just so grateful that we're able to expand this conversation and invite the rest of you to join us. And, uh, and I hope that you can join us in building relationships with each other. Um, and uh, this is the launch of a series of conversations where we want to expand this dialogue. Um, so hope to, you can join us again. Um, the next event that we have is a storytelling event in September. The Planning Commission has done a chronology um, analysis of, of the milestones of decisions that uh, um, are supposed to make a difference in the future of the city. So we will be uh, doing that in September. And uh, in um, the spirit of building relationships, we also want to invite you to join us as friends of the BCPC, um, where you will um, learn more about the activities and events that we do, and uh, we hope that you, that you can join us. And with that, I will uh, bid you all farewell, and um, I wish you strength, connection, and love and kindness for each other. So thank you, and have a good evening.